Hello, I'm Michelle Taylor, Editor-in-Chief of Laboratory Equipment. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Encapsulation Best Practices for Early Clinical Studies. Today's webinar is sponsored by Lanza Pharma and Biotech and presented by Drug Discovery and Development. Before we begin, I'd like to quickly explain how you can be a part of this webinar. As we proceed with our discussion, if you should have questions for our panelists, you may enter them into the question and answers box at any time. We will have a Q&A session directly following the last presentation, where the panelists will answer as many questions as time permits. And now I'd like to quickly introduce you to the speakers for today's program. Since 2004, Mark Capucci has been a team leader of pre-formulation product development for Lanza Pharma and Biotech. He is in charge of pre-formulation of the Pharmaceutical Development Services Group. Prior to working for Capsigel slash Lanza, he was a research associate for Amgen, working with the pre-formulations group in small, small molecule pharmaceuticals. Next, Stephanie Sastra is a process engineer of operations, dosage forms, and delivery systems at Lanza. She holds a master's degree in chemical engineering from Bucknell University. Prior to working for Lanza, she was an engineer of manufacturing technology at AstraZeneca and also worked as a process engineer for Bristol-Myers Squibb. Our next speaker is Matt Richardson, who is the manager of pharmaceutical business development at Capsigel slash Lanza. Since joining the company in 2005, he has worked with many pharmaceutical and nutraceutical customers to understand the formulation aspects of their products with two-piece hard capsules. In that time, he has also been an invited speaker at numerous seminars and webinars on topics of hard capsules, cross-linking, and capsules for use in delayed release. And with that, I'm going to hand it over into Matt's capable hands so that he can begin our presentation. Matt? Thanks very much, Michelle. And thanks to everybody uh, joining us this afternoon for the webinar. So this afternoon, we'd like to uh, accomplish several different things. But, you know, one of the first questions that we get quite fre frequently these days is, now that you're part of Lonza, what's changed? And really, with the integration into the Lonza Pharma and Biotech family, the model for small molecules and available technologies associated with them can now rep be represented in this depiction. And as you can see, it encompasses the spectrum from earliest stages of design to formulation development and the manufacture of finished drug products. And with the flexibility to tailor each of the services to the co customer project need. And this now includes drug substance intermediates, drug substances, drug product intermediates, and even finished drug products. And this model has been tested and established to the point where it currently supports over 300 development projects and more than 200 commercial scale products as well. With respect to the small molecule portion, our technologies can really be housed in four different areas of focus, as you can see represented in basically the different buckets on the slide. So the first is custom API development. And what you'll see is that there are early intermediates there are GMP and clinical study intermediates, even including high potency and cytotoxic payloads as well can be considered. Anything in those areas are now part of the option, part of the Lonzo Pharma and Biotech family. The next is bioavailability enhancement. And you'll see a lot of the technologies that we offer are aimed at doing just that, at increasing the bioavailability what we're seeing is that 70, 80% of the new products, new APIs that are coming to us, have some specific challenges as far as bioavailability are concerned. And so we have a host of technologies that are aimed at solving that problem, making it a little bit better. Some of them you can see represented here, like micronization, nanotechnologies, solid dispersions, and even lipid or liquid-based formulations as well. When we think about past bioavailability, we also have drug delivery technologies as well. And so we can look at anything from extended release to osmotics, several different multi-particulate uh, formulations, targeted delivery, and even colonic delivery are options. And then last but not least, specialized encapsulation. 
And that will be some of what we, I speak about in particular today, how do we develop and how do we offer specific capsules to streamline development. So with that, background, let's move on to what we hope to accomplish with the webinar today. I'm going to start off with an overview of specialized capsules with a focus on those that can streamline powder and capsule and also clinical phase studies. Then Mark and Stephanie are going to discuss some microdosing with the Excelidose and they even scale up with the Harrow Hofflinger, including some case studies that demonstrate the concepts therein. So when we think about specialized toolkit of capsules and encapsulation solutions, the keyword really is specialized there. There's an enormous range of products that are available, but narrowing them down to a best fit really helps us to be most productive. So the choice of capsule and polymer type then are based on a combination of the purpose of the studies and or the formulation, along with discriminating characteristics of the API so for instance, if I'm thinking about working on a pulmonary delivery versus the deep, through a DPI device, then very likely the formulation is going to have some moisture sensitivity issues and have a low dosage need as well. And so that likely that's gonna drive me towards an HPMC capsule where a low water content is inherent, but I can drive it down even further to tailor it to the formulation. And that's easily achievable. So then we start building a specialized toolkit that's developed for fit-for-purpose application. We think about the administration route, we take in those characteristics of the APIs, and then offer a series of different solution options that enable a quicker development and streamline development. So one of the first encapsulation tools that we'll talk about are the PC caps. And PC caps are typically the first time that we would introduce some sort of encapsulation technique. So the PC caps, PC just standing for preclinical, are aimed at early rodent studies that show powder and capsule and efficiency of drug early on. What kind of data can we achieve? So PC caps, capsules, you can actually avoid the use of any solvents that are incompatible. You don't even have to think about doing formulation. You can often load the API directly into the capsule and dose the rodent for early studies. The capsule helps to prevent any regurgitation in the upper GI tract, and you can deliver the exact dose as well. You can do controlled release studies as well if you think about enteric coding the um, PC capsules, and we actually even offer a white paper in order to do that as well. And then the normal characteristics of encapsulation help mask any unpleasant taste or odors when you're thinking about dosing an animal as well. The next that we'll take a look at are the DB caps. So past rodent studies, when we start thinking about early clinical trials, and often in clinical trials, our aim is for blinding a new product versus an old product. But looking at trying to do that quickly and efficiently, sometimes that's a challenge. So the DB caps capsules were created in order to do that. So um, they have a unique shape compared to the traditional capsule used for solid dose encapsulation. For the DB caps, the body and the cap have been designed with a shorter length and a wider diameter. And so there's a twofold benefit to that design in that the capsule was made shorter, so it's easier to swallow for the patient, but its increased uh, width can actually accommodate greater than 90% of the existing tablets and capsules that are on the market today. The cap's been designed to fit actually much longer over the body, and that makes it very difficult for a patient to break the blind, to get into the capsule, and makes it nearly impossible to do it without some sort of visual evidence of tampering. All the DB caps capsules are made with globally acceptable colorants, and so that allows for complete binding of the product in addition to being able to use them worldwide as well. 
And this eliminates the need to have identical placebo matching products made, so creating additional tablets or going through additional labor-intensive processes like debossing, removing ink, or removing logos from different existing materials as well. And so making a quick study, by blinded study, by taking a, either an existing or a placebo and doing quick encapsulation with both enables us to get materials to the clinic and to the patient even faster. As a complement to the DB capsule, we have a sizing kit, an over encapsulation sizing guide, if you will, that helps uh, us to streamline. So it's a rapid selection of the most appropriate DB caps that you need for the project. And you could do that by taking a look at the characteristics of either the tablet or the capsule, pairing that with the right DB caps. They come in eight different sizes and easily achievable, again, to house more than 90% of the existing products that are out there. The all-color capsule is really a different concept, but that concept is revealed in its name. It's a capsule that contains multiple colorants, and it's available in different types, either hard gelatin or in an HPMC polymer. For the gelatin, one contains all global colorants, and the one contains FDNC colorants that are commonly and most widely used. The power of the all-color capsule is the strategy of the ability to move forward with stability studies in the absence of a final choice of color and ink. Quite often, the final commercial design is yet to be determined when it's time for stability studies to begin. And so the all color, and even oftentimes marketing's just really been brought into the overall development and picture at this point when it's time for stability to start. So the all color capsule allows for these studies to proceed in such a situation as the formulations exposed to the dyes during stability and then simply removed when they're not needed or in the event that you choose a different complement. Um, and so you can go from a series of, say, six different dyes down to maybe two for the final formulation and yet not having to redo stability, which is often a time savings of anywhere from three to six months at least. Regulatory-wise, the lowering or the removal of dyes is completely acceptable, but the addition of additional dyes later on would mandate additional stability studies. So past stability, then another toolkit in our encapsulation specialized option is one that also fits well very closely with the idea of powder and capsule or a simple concept direct design and use products that are capsules developed for dry powder inhalation. These capsules are made for use in DPI devices and are available in multiple polymers, either gelatin, a couple of different strategies of HPMCs, and they're all made to maximize compatibility with the, uh, you'll choose the formulation excuse me, you'll choose the right polymer based on the formulation. So you've got a wide range of polymers to choose from to maximize that offer. And oftentimes we have some pretty complexly engineered formulations. They may look simple, but they're engineered quite complex. And so to maintain that compatibility, multiple different polymers are offered. The, the capsules, and depending on the polymer that you use, can be customized even further in several different ways. But all have very common specifications of very stringent microbial controls, and then minimized internal lubricant as well. And that is in order to maximize the performance of a dry powder inhalant off the shelf without doing customization unless it's absolutely necessary. So for any type of dry powder inhalation capsule, there's a certain specification in place to begin with. And then from there, we can customize even further as it's needed. The last area of specialized capsules that I'm gonna to discuss today that are available to maximize performance for powder and capsule studies is that of delayed release or enteric capsules. Acid-sensitive media is really becoming more common. 
and better ways of dealing with that, especially in early clinical studies, is becoming more critical as a result of that. The performance line of delayed release to critically acid-sensitive materials is available for the varying needs of molecule delivery. Foremost are the three different options that you see on the slide, the DR caps, the V caps and Teric capsule, and the intrinsic drug delivery technology that you see. DR caps was the initial foray into delayed release capsules. And while powerful as acid-resistant capsules, they still fall just short of the requirement to be considered a truly enteric option. And so to meet that need, the VCAPS enteric capsule was developed as an off-the-shelf capsule option to provide enteric performance. For critically sensitive formulations that would require absolutely 0% release in acid, the intrinsic drug, de drug delivery technology is available under license for the critically sensitive products as well. So here, V-caps and Teric capsules are the two-piece hard capsules that offer true enteric performance, but again, as an off-the-shelf capsule. The capsules are not coded for this performance, but rather offer it intrinsically due to the mix of both HPMC and pharmaceutical grade enteric cellulose material that's incorporated into its composition. A thermogelation manufacturing process enables the mixture to be molded into a hard capsule with enteric performance fully compliant to all major pharmacopoeia. So the graph on the right demonstrates the performance of the capsule when acetaminophen is used as the marker in a two-stage testing protocol. After two hours of pH 1.2, you will see that less than 5% of the acetaminophen is actually released but at the higher pH buffer, the capsule opens quickly, allowing for the rapid product dissolution as seen in the graph. What I really like to point out is that the performance that you see on this graph is one, it's not related to any banding or sealing technology. So the capsules that we're talking about, the V caps and enteric, this performance does not require any sealing or banding technology to be associated with it. Because it's a drier polymer to begin with, when it hits the media, it will absorb some of the moisture, swell a little bit, and that effectively seals the capsules off from needing a sealing or banding technology. Next, what you'll see is um, there's a comparison of a blue versus an orange line showing open or closed and that just refers to how the capsules are stored. With gelatin capsules, what you'll see is performance is often tied to the moisture content. Moisture content from an open or closed bottle situation would be very different, would be very different based on those performing criteria. But with the HPMC characteristics of the VCAPS and Teric capsule, whether you store it in an open or closed condition, you'll see that performance is not uh, discriminated against or changed as a result of those storage conditions. And so while the VCAPS enteric is a newer capsule offering in comparison to DR caps or delayed release capsules, in vitro studies and initial in vivo studies show the VCAP enteric capsule to actually outperform DR caps in terms of enteric performance. But here's a case study that shows, however, that DR caps have proven to offer great acid protection when delivering microbiotal treatment for C. difficile infections and fecal transplantation. The study demonstrated effective treatment of C. diff with the DR caps used in the formula, with the formulation. And ongoing studies with the V caps and carrot capsule show even better performance, and we continue to generate interest and see additional product request building as a result of the, having a true enteric on the market now as well. The power of having an intrinsically enteric dosage form as an off-the-shelf ready-to-use option is best captured in this slide. So speed in research and development is by far one of the strongest attributes. 
by simply loading powder API or simple formulations into enteric capsules, the capsules can rapidly be tested for results and in concert would enable rapid screening of multiple different prototypes for best fit. Intrinsically, enteric capsules will really alleviate the need for any coding steps that are typically associated with tablets and early studies, thereby removing very tedious and often inefficient steps in R&D. And here, I'm just gonna show you really quick in this build, I'll go ahead and build everything out. Oftentimes we're asked to consult on which is the best polymer to choose for a particular project. And this slide is likely an oversimplification of it, but it really addresses the primary questions and major capsule polymers in consideration. So the first thing that I often ask people is, are we marketing the product in a, in a part of the region, part of the world, that requires a non-animal polymer. And that's certainly gonna dictate whether or not we could use gelatin in its performance. And then the next would be, are you making an immediate release? Do you need a delete, delayed release? How are you going to achieve that type? If you're going to achieve it very simply, very easily, then we can use an immediate release technology as well. Or, we could use the VCAPS enteric capsule loading simple powders into that as well. And then lastly, are there moisture or cross-linking issues that are associated with the product as well? In which case, we would do something like uh, removing gelatin from the mix because of its sensitivity to either moisture or cross-linking, and thereby uh, giving us the option of using a VCAP plus capsule as to maximize it. So hopefully with that, I've been able to give you an overview of several of the different specialized capsules that have been designed both to problem solve and to expedite studies in formulation and clinical development. The combination of these capsules with powder and capsule projects can greatly simplify and streamline early studies. So now I'd like to turn the webinar over to my colleague, Mark, for the next portion. Mark, you can take it away. Thank you, Matt. Good morning to some and good afternoon to the rest of the individuals that have joined us on this presentation. As Matt alluded, uh, we will be moving into the powder and capsule microdosing portion of the presentation today. Give a little bit of an overview of the microdosing and the powder and capsule studies. Basically, the Exceladose system um, is a precise weighing of the API and or blends uh, into capsules of either gelatin composition or HPMC composition. The range of the filling will be from 0.1 milligrams to 200 milligrams per dose. We normally will run um, capsules uh, to see where the maximum fill would be of the capsules and to accurately assess what we would have for a maximum fill depending on the capsule size that is chosen for the particular study. And as you can see um, in the slide that is presented, the capsules sizes that are typically used are from size four to size double zero. A little bit about the system as, how, as it um, operates and how it operates. Basically, the powder is introduced into a hopper. The powder is then transferred into the capsule by a gravity-fed system, almost like a salt shaker. So there will be a tapping mechanism on the hopper to dispense the powder into the capsule accurately. The body of the capsule is placed onto a puck, which is sitting on a tray. And as the puck is introduced on top of the balance, the body of the capsule and the puck itself are teared. So that way the printouts 
for the Excel dose are showing exact amount of API that has been introduced into the capsule. The system will set up depending on the development of the program and the doses associated with the filling and also any correction that may be needed for the fill amount due to potency, purity, water content will be associated and then also any fill ranges that need to be applied to the actual strength of the API that's being filled into the capsule. The capsules themselves will go through the system. The system will designate whether it was a success or possibly a failing capsule due to a low fill or an overfill. Uh, those will be rejected and the capsules that have been approved will move through the system. So on this side, we'll go over a little bit of the benefits of having API in a powder and capsule study. Basically, as alluded earlier in Matt's presentation, it will help to streamline product development and increase the speed to the clinic and proof of concept. At the same time that you're generating stability information of a powder and capsule, uh, at that time, you could be in parallel running studies, sipping compatibilities, formulation development studies to have an understanding of what the final drug product would be if it needed to be in a, a blended powder in a capsule or a tablet form. But initially, you could get your informal stability on your powder and capsule to have an understanding of how the API is behaving through a typical stability study and, and understanding any of the pitfalls that may show up during that study. This also initially will streamline through so you can be able to get your information quickly and be able to eliminate the excipient compatibility study prior to running um, a full formulation study and have an understanding, especially when you're in your point of your production where API and time is very crucial. On this slide, it dictates basically the two types of Excelido systems that are at Lonzo. The one to the left, the Excelidos 120S, is a semi-automated system, which is housed in the formulation development area. This allows the operators a lot more flexibility to have an understanding of what would be the fill into the capsule, how the fill is being maintained, how the powder is behaving on the system, and any other special handling criteria that may be useful to be able to generate data to be able to transfer over into the manufacturing area where the manufacturing will house the 600 and the 600S and be able to run material production for anything for uh, clinical trial material. And as you can see, the differences between the instrumentation the 120S is more of a semi-automated system where the overall production of that will be low, whereas when you move into the 600, the 600S, the production level increases due to the fact that it is a fully automated system. Some of the things that are important and looked at of the API before any of the studies are generated on the Excelidos is just having a full understanding of the API itself, its physical and chemical characteristics that would affect anything of the nature of the fill, how the powder behaves, and be able to dispense that. Very important for, for the smaller doses is having an understanding of the particle size, uh, larger particles uh, versus smaller particles, how they're going to behave and with the several different dispensing heads that 
can be fitted on the instrumentation to be able to handle those. One of the other things that is evaluated and paid attention to very closely is the lot-to-lot -lot variability uh, of the API as it's going through its natural course of development. And as mentioned, flow properties of the material, how it's behaving, static and hindrances, hindrances <coughs> excuse me, and any other environmental effects that could be altering or changing or hindering the API from flowing properly are evaluated and make, make sure that they're assessed and understood before moving into the manufacturing arena. Some of the key risk areas for API and capsule studies, as mentioned, is the environmental effects of the API, having an understanding if your material is very hydroscopic, and does it need to be handled in a low humidity condition to be able to keep the flow in a reasonable sense to be able to move forward in production. Light sensitivity does play a role for some compounds and being able to assess the material and be able to fill in a low light environment to be able to not have that effect show up during your studies. Containment is also looked at for the, for the API Several different um, APIs do come through with different classifications and different handling procedures. Um, and containment for the instrumentation is also evaluated to see if that is needed for moving on to the next phase. Some of the microdosing best practices that are looked at um, from the experience that has been gained here at Lonza is that more than 200 APIs have been filled per microdosing. That's equivalent to more than 700 batches. And having the fill range in a typical for those falling into 100 micrograms to 120 milligrams. Any? On this slide is basically the dosing range information to date, where, as mentioned before, the smallest dose to date is 0.1 milligrams or 100 micrograms, and the largest dose to date is 250 milligrams. And the percent RSD typically falls between less than 2% for your particular runs. And the typical weight acceptance for our fills is plus or minus 5%, which shows basically the, on the printouts for what would be considered an acceptable capsule and a capsule that could be rejected. So in the next couple slides, I'll go over a couple case studies that we have seen and some of the resolutions and outcomes for those particular studies. One of the challenges that we received was that you know, a very high potent drug where the client wanted to have a very low dose for the study. And the amount that was needed for the fill weight was 0 0.1 milligrams to be able to fill into a size one capsule. And basically when you're filling that amount into a size one capsule, um, it's very challenging on the respect where you're trying to get a percent RSD within an acceptable range to not get a very low yield out of your material. So we are able to proceed forward uh, with the acceptable range of the material, uh, work with the material as is, um, change some of the conditions, um, look at the different dispensing heads, and be able to handle the material so that way we're able to fill within acceptable range of plus or minus 5% and be able to have the yield for the low dose to be approximately 46% for the batch. Another case study that we have seen is for a micro dispensing of a blend. 
this is where a client was working on a particular project and that they wanted to get into the reformulation of the encapsulated blend to provide 30 megs of API in a 200 meg total blend weight. And then basically that this was being generated for a one-time pediatric dose at five milligrams. And from the point of view from the client, they didn't want to go in and do a lot of reformulation, be able to generate more stability. We're looking at a lower dose. So in a sense, the project was able to be completed by looking and, I'm sorry, taking the current um, drug product, milling it down, and being able to fill it into the capsules and be able to proceed on with, that, uh, with the corrected weight to be able to hit the target dose. Another case study that we saw was for a comparator assessment where the client wanted to compare study that was needed for immediate release and needed to be able to achieve lower doses. Uh, the commercial tablet supplied was a 250 megs of API and a 400 meg tablet. And basically the same principle where the material, I mean the tablets were milled to produce a powder blend and then the target dose was captured by the appropriate fill weight that was generated to be able to proceed on forward. Uh, the outcome was that the all the capsules met assay and content uniformity for the dose into the within acceptance criteria, and the clinical delivery date was met for the particular project. Case study four, where pediatric sprinkle capsules were generated, where the challenge was looking at being able to fill the material into sprinkle caps and be able to use the formulation to move forward and be able to look at multiple dose combinations where a two pellet, one pellet low dose fill. The biggest uh, constraints were the low dose filling into sachets, which resulted in the possibility of pellets being trapped within the sachet and that the potential if a pellet was lost that the potency value or the, um, um, sorry, the overall strength of the capsule would be lost. For that, the material was placed into the Accelero system and filled appropriately to be able to meet the target. Here on this slide is just an over, overview of the acceladoses that are present at Lonza, as you can see for the North America here at the Tampa, Florida facility, uh, the several different acceladoses that are present and the capabilities, along with the accelados capabilities that are present in Europe at our Promel site. And from there, I will turn over the presentation to Stephanie. Thank you, Mark. And once again, thanks everybody for joining us today. Now that you have seen our capabilities for Accelero Systems, I will be presenting our newest equipment addition at the Tampa facility, the Harrow Hoffliger Modu-C Mid-Speed Encapsulator. The Modu-C MS Encapsulator can support clinical trial in commercial scale manufacturing with a throughput of up to 72,000 capsules per hour. However, this is dependent on the number of dosing cycles needed and the API characteristics. The operation of the Modu C MS is fully automatic. The empty capsule shells are automatically loaded into the capsule hopper via the Convé C utilizing compressed air. Once loaded into the capsule hopper of the machine, the capsules are oriented and the caps and bodies are separated into the machine's capsule holding segments. The segments are mounted onto the machine turntable and as the turntable moves, the segments rotate through all of the capsule stations. 
After confirming the capsule separation, the capsules are filled by the connected dosing station. The caps and bodies are then rejoined, closed, and ejected. Any capsule that is not fully separated or outside of the specified dosing limits or improperly closed are automatically rejected. The Module C MS encapsulator has a modular design, so the basic unit can be equipped with different trolleys that can be changed out depending on the dosing system required. So theoretically, you could have up to three dosing stations on one trolley. At this time, the trolley available at Tampa is the drum filler for microdosing powder and capsule, which is shown here on the slide. The drum filler operates with drums custom designed for a given powder. Each drum has 12 bores precision drilled into the drum body to provide the exact fill volume for every dose. As the drum rotates, powder is pulled into the bores with vacuum assistance, leveled with a scraper bar, and blown out into the capsules with compressed air. The typical dosing volume is 1 to 100 cubic millimeters for a dosing range of 0.5 to 50 milligrams. Additionally, a single drum can be used to dose multiple strengths just by increasing the number of dosing cycles. The RST of acceptable capsules is typically less than 3%. This technology is ideal for extremely cohesive powders with low impact forces, so it works well with most APIs. Now I will go over some of the benefits of utilizing the Modu CMS for powder and capsule products, which helps target key areas. It strengthens speed to market capabilities with a smooth transition from Excelidose technology without costly reformulation expenses. The Modu C is able to quickly and precisely dispense drug substances, even for highly cohesive powders. Each dose is individually verified to be within the specified fill limits set for product using the Advanced Mass Verification System, or AMV. Every batch manufactured on the Harrow Hoffliger yields comprehensive batch documentation and data trending straight from the HMI. Lanza has the capability for high potent API handling and containment using the Easy Dock Containment Sanitary Valve and Easy Flow Charge Bags for OEB5 or SafeBridge 4 compounds. And finally, the suite for the Modu CMS was also specifically designed to be capable for low humidity operations. One of the advantages of using the Modu CMS that I discussed on the previous slide that I wanted to give a few more details on is the Advanced Mass Verification System, or AMV. The AMV provides 100% inline fill mass control. It has 12 sensors, one for each of the drum boards, where the powder falls through the sensor channels into the capsule bodies. As the powder falls through the channel, measures the signal, which is proportional to the mass of the powder. Any dose that is outside of the specified fill limits is rejected. All of the measured fill weights can then be viewed on the HMI using histograms or run charts for data trending throughout your batch. Prior to starting a batch using the AMV, the AMV must be calibrated. The AMV measurements are highly dependent on the falling behavior of the powder, and therefore, calibration is critical. The calibrations are performed by collecting multiple doses into crucibles and comparing the AMV sensor's fill measurements against gravimetric measurements. So in summary, we are able to see today that Lanza offers comprehensive powder and capsule services tailored to meet your specific applications. Our formulation services offer excipient selection and blend design, finished form design and development for not only powder and capsules, but for multi-particulates and tablets as well. And finally, specialized capsules like Enteric and DPI tailored for a specific application. For capsule filling, manufacturing can be completed in non-GMP and GMP conditions. We have the capability of handling APIs with safety classifications of OEB-5 or SafeBridge-4. Best practices have been developed for performing pattern capsule studies. Microdosing 
can be performed under specialized conditions such as low humidity. And now, powder and capsule filling can be completed at a large scale utilizing the Harrell Hopfliger Mondu CMS encapsulator without a formulation change from Exelodose filling. Analytical services can provide release testing of API, excipients, and finished products, method development and qualification, and non-GMP and GMP stability studies. Finally, the Clinical Supply Services team offers non-GMP and GMP packaging, clinical labeling, double blinding, and randomization, QP release of packaged product, and distribution. So at this point, we'd like to turn it over and answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and also Matt and Mark, who spoke earlier. Um, those are, that's some great information you provided us with. But as Stephanie said, audience, we have now arrived at the Q&A portion of the webcast. If you have not done so already, which some of you have, you can submit any questions you may have for the panelists via the question and answers box uh, right on your screen. But in the meantime, why don't we get started here? Let's um, have a question for Matt. Matt, what considerations should be taken when choosing a capsule type for an Alzheimer's oral dosage form? Okay, a, a interesting question. So for me, when I think about the, the polymer type for that, it really comes down to the characteristics of both the API and the formulation. Are we dealing with something that is going to be moisture sensitive, for instance? Is it something that has any criteria uh, of the API or the formulation that is going to drive us towards choosing one polymer over the other? So, you know, we would actually need a little bit more information related to that formulation in order to, to choose the right polymer. Um, you know, as a base choice, I recommend, if, if you've got to pick something to start with, my best recommendation is usually something like the VCAP Plus capsule, the HPMC. It, um, it streamlines in, in the way of, I see fewer people having to go back and redo studies because of moisture or cross-linking or things like that. But if there are particular characteristics that we need to address, oxidation or things like that, then a, a bigger discussion is gonna happen. So my because of the specific nature of that particular question, my advice is really to get in touch. Uh, I think our um, information as far as either uh, our email addresses and things like that are related or captured here. You know, I'm happy to speak with folks individually and specifically about, you know, how, how specific it is and, and determine the best path forward. Great, thank you. Um, and we have another question for you while we have you. Um, can you further explain intrinsically enteric capsule technologies? Sure. So um, intrinsically just means that it's built into the capsule. So because of the manufacturing process that we have for the VCAP enteric capsule, we have taken some enteric cellulosic material. We've put that into the HPMC. We've made a polymer that's combined to both. That way, the properties that allow for an enteric protection are built into the capsule. And so it doesn't rely on a post-manufacturing step like coating or something like that in order to be enteric. It's built into the capsule in and of itself. Okay, great. Mark, let's jump over to you with a couple questions now. Our first would be, would you support early stage companies with a small number of capsules and studies? Yes, we would. Uh, we have the ability here, or the method development um, area, to be able to bring in a small amount of API and to be able to fill capsules, from at least from a powder and capsule perspective and at least get a first read on how the API is behaving in a certain environment, or uh, at least get some initial reads on some evaluations uh, in related to the assay, uh, related substances, or any other uh, test that may be 
may need to be associated uh, with the material and then its properties and how it's behaving. Okay, great. That's wonderful news. Um, another question for you, um, something you were talking about during the presentation. Um, what was the total weight of the blend that had only 0 0.1 milligrams of API? For that, for that particular study, that was API alone. Uh, to answer that question, uh -huh. um, that particular study we were filling in. Um, it would, after correction, it actually was 0 0.11 milligrams into a size one capsule to be able to proceed on with that study. And that uh, presentation was put up on stability and then used uh, to conduct uh, informal stability in, in, um, in accordance with ICH guidelines. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, your turn now. Um, can you talk about the cleanability of the Maju CMS? You know, how can when, if researchers use it, how can they ensure that no carryover um, happens in the dedicated parts? Sure. So the Hair Hoffliger, it's it has a high cleanability. It's easily disassembled. Um, we have cleaning recommendations for the machine uh, per product, so we can target the each product. Um, we also perform cleaning verifications after every product is manufactured using swabs to ensure that there's no carryover left on the machine. Um, but the only dedicated part on the machine would be the drum that's custom designed for each product. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we, know, we all know how important uh, cross-contamination is, so it's good to have an easily cleanable product. Um, and another one for you, Stephanie, is Hero-based encapsulation directly scalable from the Excelido system? And is it the same for outer large-scale en encapsulation equipment also? Uh, yeah, so there is no formulation change required when scaling up from the Excelido system to the Hero Hopliger. Um, additional powder studies may need to be performed just to define the bore size of the drum and to optimize the parameters of the HARO as the method of dosing changes from the tapping of the powder out of a dispense head to the volumetric fill dosing using vacuum and compressed air. For uh, scaling to other large scale encapsulation equipment, it would require a lot more work, such as like reformulating the product since the dosing of such small quantities of powder are not feasible with like, tamping pin or dosator style encapsulators. Okay, great. Um, now, Matt, back to you for some questions. Um, would you recommend any other situation beyond a quote-unquote new empty capsule shell lot to calculate an average shell weight for filling? Okay, we may have lost Matt for the second, so um, let's move on there. Um, back to cleaning. Stephanie, we're going to come back to you. Um, uh, do you need any type of cleaning verification when you're doing this? Um, you know, what about for HPLC for each API or TOC for everything? What, what, what can be done there? Uh, yeah, for the... Cleaning verification, as I said, we do perform that after every product um, with the swabs, and those are analyzed using HPLC. Okay, great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we have Matt back, so we're going to throw that question back at him because it's a great one. Uh, Matt, would you recommend any other situation beyond a quote-unquote new empty capsule shell lot to calculate an average shell weight for filling? Um, so there's a couple different strategies you can think about doing there. Um, you know, there, it's a pretty fairly narrow range when you think about the plus or minus on any given shell, and that's given to the the size of the capsule and the weight range. What you can do is request a tighter range to begin with on your specification. So for some capsules that you can easily achieve a plus or minus two milligram, depending on the size of the capsule. And so that certainly reduces the amount um, as far as that goes. 
uh, of say fluctuation plus or minus over that range. So you can always do what we call a weight sorting option to give yourself a, a more narrow range. Uh, there's probably some filling techniques as well. I'm probably not the best person to address it from a filling aspect. There are pre and post weighers and things like that. Um, but you know, in general, I say when you have questions about that, a going for something with a tighter range spec is the way to go first. Great, thank you. Um, while we have you, we have another one for you. Could you please explain the removal of colorants from the all color capsule? Sure, so um, when you think about using the all color capsule, what you get uh, in, is really, it ends up being a very dark capsule to begin with. It looks like um, a dark blue, almost a purplish black capsule. And that's because we've added so many colorants in addition to titanium dioxide as an opaquant for that all color capsule. But say, you know, marketing comes back at the end of the day and says, well, what we want to do is we want to market this as a yellow capsule. So yellow is one of my colorants that I've started with on that all color capsule. It's certainly one, but it's not all the others. So from a regulatory standpoint, you've already done stability of the formulation with that yellow color in a field of all the other colors. But if I take all those other color, colors out for a final, I don't have to redo stability if I keep that yellow at that same level because I've already done that stability work with that particular yellow color at, at that level. And so what we can do is even we're, though we've got a lot of colorants in the all color capsule, if we remove them from a regulatory standpoint, We've already demonstrated that stability with that particular colorant in the all color capsule. So there's really no need to go back and redo that stability. And that's the point that, that I was hoping to, to get across for mm -hmm. folks when we think about removing colorants from the final material. Got it. Okay. Um, we're going to finish up uh, with one or two more questions. So Mark, we're going to turn to you quickly. Uh, what is maximum practical filling capacity, like capsules per hour, for microdosing applications? Okay, that's pretty much a two-part question. So I'll answer the first part. The maximum filling capacity will depend on the nature of the API. Basically, it's particle particle size, uh, how it flows, how it fills. As I mentioned, for the Accelados, um, the powder is gravity fed into, uh, gravity falls into the uh, capsule, so pretty much like a salt shaker. So how it falls and how it layers into the capsule and how it behaves will depend on what will be the maximum fill capacity for the capsule depending on the size. As for the second part of the question, um, the how many capsules per hour, that will go in line with the filling of the material. If you're looking at something that's going to be a a fill of 100 milligrams, it's taking about four to five seconds to have a fill. Um, your filling capacity for the day is going to be a little bit long, uh, greater. If you're looking at something that's going to have to take a little bit more time, where we start getting into the higher end of what we consider acceptable filling time of about you know, eight to 10 seconds, that may increase your overall time for your material and be able to go from there. It also depends on your dose. If you're looking at a low dose, and you have a, a lot of powder that you're able to put into the hopper, be able to go from there. Or if you have a high dose where you're constantly having to stop the production, be able to fill more powder into the hopper depending on the strength and be able to go from there. So the fluctuations will be really driven by how the powder behaves and the dose that you're looking to achieve. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Matt, we have one more question for you, and then we're going to finish it up with that. Um, it's a good general question. You spoke earlier about different polymers that can be used in specialized capsules. Do you have any general advice or recommendations on when to use one versus the other? Sure. So uh, in general, uh, I would say when there are gelatin and HPMC, uh, the VCAP Plus tend to be the two that are great as all purpose. But when you think about um, taking out some of the, the risk factors involved with moisture or cross-linking or things like that, we definitely recommend starting with the VCAP Plus HPMC capsule. Uh, the only time that I recommend maybe we definitely want to look at a gelatin is when we're thinking about 
oxidation potentials. And sometimes that could be mitigated by adding some antioxidant to the formulation, but otherwise we could switch to a gelatin and think about it because it's very restrictive as far as airflow goes and totally protects the formulation from effects of oxidation. So from a moisture standpoint, I want to go with an HPMC. From a cross-linking standpoint, I want to go with an HPMC. Um, from an oxidation standpoint, I want to go with a gelatin. And those are typically the key criteria for immediate release. And when we go into the, the delayed or enteric release, then there's really only one, one option that we want to think about from a standalone capsule, and that's the VCAPS enteric. Got it. Perfect. Um, well, audience, that just about wraps up all the time we have today. Um, so we'd like to say a thank you to Matt, Mark, and Stephanie um, for sharing their expertise with us. Um, a big thank you to Lonza for sponsoring this event. And, of course, a special thank you to you for our audience for joining us today. We hope you found the webinar educational and informative. Um, and it will be available on demand on the Drug Discovery and Development website in about 24 hours if you would like to come back and watch it. Thank you again. We hope you have a great day.